Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basak. And from our studios in Washington, D.C., I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. And Kaylee, Bitcoin is rising to the highest level in more than two years, hovering around 57,000 amid persistent investor demand, including from MicroStrategy, which bought another 3,000 coins. We'll talk about this surge and the importance of Web3 transaction platforms with Chainlink co-founder Sergey Nazarov. And cryptocurrency critic Senator Elizabeth Warren has a new challenger for her seat. We're going to discuss that dark horse lawyer backed by the crypto industry in part. All right, so all of that is ahead. But first, let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. And what you will find is the rally is alive and well when it comes to digital assets. Bitcoin now up 4.5% on the day, north of $57,000. This is the highest level going back to November of 2021 and brings Bitcoin's year-to-date rally to about 36% after it gains nearly 160% in 2023. Interestingly, Ether is actually outperforming on the year 2024 thus far, up about 40 percent, but it's underperforming relative to Bitcoin today, up just by 1.7 percent. And of course, as you're seeing the alley, uh, the rally in digital assets, you're seeing it in corresponding uh, digital asset related equities, including MicroStrategy, Big Bitcoin Proxy, adding even more Bitcoin to its balance sheet and reaping the reward today up more than 10 percent, 10 and a half percent right now. And Coinbase, that largest public exchange, is higher by about 3.6 percent on the day. There is a lot of green on the screen, Chanali. And part of that green is brought to you by those spot Bitcoin ETFs. And of course, that has helped drive the rally in part here. Let's take a look at just what a historic month this has been, because iShare is seeing a $6 billion inflow. And remember, above that, you also see Fidelity with another more than $4 billion and ARK's product at around $1.5 billion. So certainly a lot of interest through most of these products throughout the month and a lot of superlatives to talk through. But another one in particular, Grayscale, we have to talk about how instead it was hit by more than $7 billion and outflows here really against the pack. Let's flip up the board here and talk about Grayscale for a minute because it experienced outflows every single day since that launch or conversion rather from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to the ETF product. And the question is how long this continues for them. You did see a lessening of those outflows as the month went on. And remember, there were some critical players here to be aware of, Kaylee, when you think about the bankrupt assets here, the estates that had to sell this and the flows that we've seen move away from a higher fee product into lower fee products. We'll see whether this move has been saturated. Well, while we're talking about moves in this space, Shanali, let's continue on the moves that we have seen in Bitcoin prices as we hit levels not seen since the fall of 2021. Micro strategy, as I mentioned, keeps buying the tokens, adding some 3,000 Bitcoin to its holdings. And just last week, the chair Men of MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor, told Bloomberg there is trillions of dollars worth of potential upside. Uh, Bitcoin is is the exit strategy. It, it is the the uh, strongest asset. So, what we see right now is the Bitcoin has just emerged as a trillion dollar asset class, and it's alongside uh, names like Apple and Google and Microsoft. But the difference between Bitcoin and the Magnificent Seven is Bitcoin's an asset class. It's not a company. There's not a lot, enough room in the capital structure of those companies to hold 10 trillion or 100 trillion dollars worth of capital. Now, according to CoinMarketCap, the global crypto market cap is back over the $2 trillion threshold. And Bitcoin's outlook is even more bullish when you think about the upcoming halving. We're going to bring in Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Isabel Lee to talk to us about the optimism underpinning this move. You've certainly seen a rapid rise back above 57000 What's driving it? It's really astonishing. To your point, it's above $2 trillion now. And it's astonishing because just two years ago, the market cap was at 819. This was at the depths of the bear market. So now it's back above 2.2. And at its highest, Bitcoin, the whole market cap, rather, of the crypto assets was at 2.7. So why is Bitcoin up this much? Obviously, Bitcoin is the biggest coin. It's driving the rally higher. It's up 12% this week, 32% this year. It's really because of a slew of reasons. The optimism around Bitcoin ETFs, we have the halving, and you throw in there Michael Saylor buying Bitcoin ETFs. And of course, if you go more macro, you add that the Fed is easing. So that obviously drives risk assets, and Bitcoin is one of them. So it's green on the screen. It's just really a lot of optimism out there. Well, Isabel, you mentioned the halving. Obviously, that is up and coming. I just wonder how much market pricing is already reflecting the anticipation of that. What's the sentiment around that event? 
The sentiment towards halving is really positive because if you go by history, the last three halvings saw Bitcoin's price rise. So just for the uninitiated, halving is basically when they cut down the reward that miners receive into half. So now miners receive 6.125 per block of Bitcoin, and now they're going to receive three, around three. Um, and just for context, when Bitcoin uh, was launched around 2009, Miners receive up to 50. So this is really the scarcity play here of Bitcoin. There are only 21 million coins, and that's why a lot of people are saying that it's a great inflation hedge. And now Bitcoin is outperforming a lot of traditional risk assets, including equities, the Nasdaq, the S&P, and even gold. So that's why a lot of folks are really bullish about the space. How should investors consider what's already been priced in here? I think that's the number one thing, because... Bitcoin these days hasn't been as volatile. Back then, when you see bad news, you see a dip. When you see good news, there's a rise. But then now, it seems like the optimism is a lot more steady, mainly because it's powered by a number of things and not just one random headline. You see the ETF space. You see a lot of institutional investors really piling into Bitcoin um, with the ETF. That's really the, num the number one vehicle. And there's now a net $6.1 billion inflows so far for the nine Bitcoin ETFs, at least. All right, Bloomberg's Isabel Lee, thank you so much. Now let's bring in Chainlink co-founder Sergey Nazarov to continue this conversation. Sergey, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Great to see you again. As we think about where we are right now, when it comes to Bitcoin, highest level since the fall of 2021, which was really around the peak of the bull market, which we know was in pretty short order, followed by a very deep bear market that we've now come out of. Should we be confident that this is going to be sustained this time around? What's different now compared to several years ago? Great. Th thank you for having me. H historically, the, the way that this has evolved is that net new buyers drive uh, more adoption and, and market cycles. And I think the question to ask is, who are the net new buyers in this cycle? And the net new buyers is the global financial system, which is a very, very big group of net new buyers. The Bitcoin ETF is just um, an initial offering that allows the global financial system to have basically investment rails, payment rails, ways to put capital towards cryptocurrency and towards Bitcoin within structures that they find comfortable for them and normal and something that right. they can do from a risk point of view. So I, I think if you look at the total net new market that's opening up mm -hmm. through things like ETFs and you do the basic arithmetic on that, then even within certain conservative estimates, uh, you can see that there's still a lot more value that can flow into not only Bitcoin ETFs, but other cryptocurrency ETFs. And in my opinion, that's really just the beginning, because the next stage is then uh, asset tokenization, where banks see all these inflows into ETFs, right. and then they make assets to compete with the ETFs or to get some of that capital. So, Sergey, in your mind, is the fact that ETF products now exist, is that representative of a turning point in the adoption cycle? Yes, I would say that's a watershed moment where the top uh, asset managers in the world, the biggest asset manager, many of the other large asset managers have gotten to a level of comfort with the asset and the legal dynamics around the asset that they're willing to put out very structured uh, financial products. That's definitely a watershed moment that if you talk to people about five years ago even, I think they would have very serious doubts about that possibility. And that watershed moment is basically a way for a very large market to access cryptocurrency. And the size of that market, I think, isn't fully understood by even um, you know, the average consumer or even some of the other institutions. I think it's really quite a massive market. Uh, so it is a watershed moment, and it is really the global financial market mm -hmm being part of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology right. in a way that didn't exist before. Explain the institutional interest here, because I think a lot of people have been talking about the retail interest driven by the ETFs, but the reality is institutions like a BlackRock getting more involved in the crypto infrastructure world here has been part of the excitement. But do they want to be heavily exposed to tokens outside of Bitcoin, or are they more intently trying to find a way to tokenize traditional financial assets? I think all the asset managers that I've spoken to, and we've spoken to many of the biggest ones, um, they're focused on serving their clients' needs. And they have a spectrum of clients from retail to institutional. I think the clients' needs come down to certain uh, risk tolerances and legal guarantees, which are now starting to appear around cryptocurrencies that are made not by banks or asset managers. So traditional ideas of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ether or others. There is another trend of real-world asset tokenization 
where banks uh, are basically going to do another wave of securitization, but now it's going to be called tokenization. And the massive amount of things that can be tokenized extends from their core business of money market funds, interest-bearing assets, to the more cutting-edge things like carbon credits, real estate, private equity tokenization. So really, uh, I think the offering of already existing cryptocurrency products in a legally compliant wrapper is meeting current client demand because they understand what cryptocurrency is. And the next stage is not for asset managers and banks to simply repackage existing cryptocurrencies, but to make their own tokens. So 20, 30, 40 years from now, I want to have a little bit of a meta thought around all of this. Do you even need ETFs in a world where financial companies tokenize existing assets? So ETFs, I think, are more of a legal structure, and they're a way for people to interact with an asset through a set of um, legal standards and a set of payment mechanisms. Um, I think those legal standards and pay payment mechanisms can remain, but th the way that the ETF works technically on the back end may change. If it'll be called an ETF or not, I think it's very likely that it could be called an ETF because there's a lot of um, legal assurance and there's a lot of payment uh, processing that goes into interacting with ETFs that's already built. But if an ETF's assets and the ETF itself ends up existing on chain eventually and ends up moving between um, different counterparties on chain, I think on the timeline that you uh, talked about, I think that's definitely going to happen. What is the promise of DeFi in an era here where we're seeing so much centralization of the most popular cryptocurrencies? So the promise of DeFi is really two things. The first one is security and the ability to keep assets secure away from adversaries, make sure that there's a higher level of security. And in a world where cybersecurity is becoming more and more of an issue, um, I think that the security of assets will become a larger and larger question. AI, I also don't think, will contribute to security. I think it'll make security more of a problem um, also for assets. And then the second thing is that in DeFi, you don't need to rely on the reputation of a counterparty because you can verify the smart contract that represents your relationship. So the traditional financial system is based on brand promises where your entity and my entity have existed for over 100 years and we can do business because we know each other. The way that DeFi works is it mathematically guarantees contractual outcomes. So your reputation and my reputation and your words and my words shouldn't really matter if we have a system that's mathematically guaranteeing that the contract works in a certain way. And I, I think that once people uh, truly understand how this affects their counterparty risk and their ability to transact in a way that's immune to manipulation by anyone, it's simply a superior format for all value and all transactions. Certainly a push-pull between the traditional financial industry and the crypto industry in itself. Chainlink co-founder Sergey Nazarov, we thank you for your time. And coming up next, Andrew O'Neill of S&P Global explains why a potential Ether ETF could create a problem in concentration for the token. And a crypto lawyer has his sight set on Elizabeth Warren's Senate seat in Massachusetts. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk about the prospect of an Ether ETF because the token has been rising in some fashion faster than Bitcoin. And that's on the likelihood of a potential SEC approval. S&P Global says the approval of such an ETF threatens to exacerbate the ecosystem's concentration problem by keeping stake token in the hands of a few providers. Bloomberg's Emily Grafeo has been reporting on this. And it's worth first just talking about the basics, the details, the mm -hmm. timeline. How fast can this get done? So right now, the first deadline that the SEC has to respond to an issuer, there are over seven issuers right now that have filed for a spot Ether ETF, is May 23rd. That's when um, VanX application is due. So the SEC can approve it or they will deny the application. And if they do that, then there are other steps that VanEck can take. They can go through a litigation process, which we know Grayscale did with the spot Bitcoin ETF process, or they can refile the application. And then the other issuers have some dates that are 
beyond May 23rd, but most people in the ecosystem right now expect that just like with the spot Bitcoin ETFs, the decision that the SEC makes for the first um, deadline will apply to all of the other funds. Well, and Emily, when we consider how the SEC may be thinking about a spot Ether product, it's worth keeping in mind that while Gary Gensler and the SEC had broadly said that Bitcoin was not a security, that distinction nece hasn't necessarily been made for Ether. They've been a little bit reluctant to define what it is legally. How might that complicate this process and what other complications could there be? Yeah, that's right, Kaylee. Right now, all of the filings are assuming that Ether is a commodity. But if there's anything that comes out in between now on May 23rd that would change that. It would certainly throw another loop in for um, these issuers. And we also know that after Gary Gensler approved the spot Bitcoin ETFs, the statement didn't exactly signal that all of a sudden the SEC is fully embracing um, the crypto community. So I think there are a number of issuers out there that have these filings in, but there is some caution about how the SEC actually feels about approving a second uh, spot crypto uh, filing. We also know that um, when the Bitcoin ETF approval happened, there was a correlation study between uh, the Bitcoin spot market and the Bitcoin futures market that a lot of the right. issuers used. And we haven't seen that yet with Ether. So we're still waiting um, to see if a third party will come out and conduct that study. So that's just another uh, consideration before May 23rd. All right. Well, we will look forward to your continuing reporting on this in the months to come. Bloomberg's Emily Grafeo, appreciate it. Now, let's discuss this further with the author of a report about those spot uh, Ether ETFs, potentially. Andrew O'Neill, co-chair of S&P Global's Digital Assets Research Lab, is joining us now. Andrew, thanks so much for being here. So essentially, your concern is around validator concentrations. As you put out this research, what assumptions were you making about just how big these products could become? How big would they need to be to create this kind of concentration risk? Well, Bailey Janelli, thank you for having me on the show. Um, absolutely. Uh, the uh, I guess picking up on uh, where uh, Emily left off, uh, there are uh, eight applications in there currently under review by the SEC and two of those contemplate uh, the uh, staking of the underlying uh, Ether, so that they would be not only holding the asset, but they would be participating in the Ethereum network as a validator through certain intermediaries uh, or protocols, and how they might choose to do that uh, uh, could have significant impact for concentration risk. So if you just look at the total volume of staked Ether today, it's about uh, $90 billion um, equivalent. If you look at the um, current concentration uh, through the LIDO protocol is just under a third of that, and uh, the concentra concentration staked through Coinbase is about uh, about 15% of that. If you then look at the uh, inflows into uh, Bitcoin uh, ETFs, take that as a comparable, we're not projecting what the actual number might be over a short matter of months, but it's easy to see that the number could be big enough to move the dial. Well, what are, you, um, mm -hmm. what are you most concerned about here? The fact that the concentration risk creates security risks or just is this an economic concern that too many players or too few players rather will have too much of the pie? So concentration risk matters uh, when it comes to Ethereum because it affects the consensus mechanism. So in order to have uh, financial settlement guarantees uh, when using uh, the Ethereum blockchain, you need to have finalized blocks. So the block, the new block that has your transaction, you need that to be finalized. That is what makes it immutable. How does that block get finalized? It gets finalized when you have the consensus of two thirds of the validators participating in the network. So if you have concentrations within that validator set, you start having risks uh, that perhaps you don't have two thirds of validators available. Perhaps they're offline. Perhaps they're acting in a way that's uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, maybe censoring transactions or otherwise not uh, not um, uh, beneficial to the broader network. So if you look at this, this happened last year, for example, in May, there was a delayed finality event on the Ethereum blockchain that lasted uh, a few hours. That at the time happened due to a bug in the software that some of the validators were running. But if you'd consider that some of the uh, stake may be concentrated in specific places, in that be that an entity or a protocol, you could have a concentration of operational risk that could lead to validators being offline. And that 
introduces risk dependencies and trust assumptions in a network that is trying to be decentralized. Uh, and so that's uh, just a, a very important development to monitor uh, from a um, risk analysis perspective. Just from a price perspective, quickly, Andrew, we only have about a minute left. All of these concentration concerns on the network itself are one thing. But what do you think actually could happen in terms of prices, considering what we're seeing with Bitcoin north of $57,000 after the introduction of spot Bitcoin products? So I think long term, uh, what drives demand for uh, Ether is um, the use of the network. Uh, and the use of therefore ether for uh, for transaction co covering trans transaction costs on uh, the network. So uh, to the extent that there are concerns around concentration uh, in, in the network, that could be an inhibitor mm. to um, uh, to growth in its use. Uh, conversely, to the extent that these uh, these risks are kind of managed in a robust way, that we see diversification of stake, uh, then that may be uh, less of a risk factor. Clearly, uh, there's a strong interest in uh, the ETF development. That will be one factor uh, driving prices. We don't have a price projection out there on, on mm -hmm. any of these assets, but, uh, but those are the, uh, the dynamics. Andrew O'Neill, co-chair of S&P Global Digital Assets Research Lab, we thank you for your analysis and some key warnings about a potential new ETF. Now coming up, Elizabeth Warren's Senate challenger is a crypto proponent. We're gonna talk about those details next. Stick with us, this is Bloomberg. For a lot of politicians, crypto has become a, a soundbite where they don't really understand how crypto works and they, they say things that actually don't even back up with facts. So, you know, I do think it's a it's a campaign issue. Ripple has leaned into that. I personally, you know, my donations are bipartisan, but certainly pro crypto, and that'll continue to be the case. I'll even highlight just today, uh, John Deaton, a very prominent pro crypto guy announced he's running against Elizabeth Warren. That was Ripple CEO talking about John Deaton, a crypto lawyer taking on Elizabeth Warren for Senate in Massachusetts. We should say, though, Kaylee, while he's taking her on, Elizabeth Warren did run and win by 24 points the last time she ran. So it's a high hurdle. Yeah, definitely a tough challenge, but that isn't to say that Elizabeth Warren could have more crypto-related challenges coming her way. As super PAC money could be used against her, there's a lot of upset within the industry over the anti-money laundering legislation she's pushing on Capitol Hill. I'll actually have an interview with the Democratic senator from Massachusetts later on today, so tune into that at 5 p.m. New York time. We'll be back with Bloomberg Crypto next Tuesday. This is Bloomberg.